I'm Crystal Rodero, I'm a PhD student in King's College London, and I'm going to talk um, about linking statistical shape models and simulated function in the healthy adult human heart. So the idea here is to close the gap or build a bridge between uh, the areas of cardiac anatomy and cardiac function in the way that we describe both uh, mechanistically. So cardiac anatomy, we can describe it through statistical shape analysis as Maciej uh, showed us yesterday. And cardiac function, the way to describe it that uh, we can is uh, through simulations. In particular, I will be focusing on, <coughs> sorry, on electromechanical simulations. Um, but the problem here is that they are usually quite uh, expensive computationally. So to do some sort of um, sensitivity analysis, we cannot run as many simulations as we would like. So to overcome this gap, um, I will be talking about how um, we use global sensitivity analysis to close this gap or to try to at least. And this global sensitivity analysis is based on emulators. So I will go, I will give an overview of these three areas that we um, explored in this project. I'm happy to reply to any questions after the talk. So, and the first one is cardiac anatomy and statistical shape analysis. Uh, we started uh, with CT scans of uh, healthy adult. Um, human heart. Uh, so these were patients that came to the emergency room with chest pains, but then they didn't find any uh, cardiac condition, so we treat them as, as healthy controls. And then we did some semi-automatic segmentation, so we segmented the blood pools, the aorta, um, the, the myocardial walls, and then uh, we used some surfaces uh, for the pulmonary veins and for the vena cava. So then we can also apply boundary conditions for the mechanics there. Uh, we mesh them, we mesh these segmentations uh, achieving uh, tetrahedral uh, meshes uh, to which we assign also myofibers in a rule-based manner. So we, we specify which angle in the epicardium and which angle in the endocardium and then it varies linearly through the myocardium. This pipeline was presented previously uh, by uh, one of my colleagues with Marina Strocci in PLOS ONE uh, this year. Uh, she applied it to heart failure hearts and in this case it's uh, healthy controls but it's the same pipeline. With this, um, we achieve uh, 20 meshes of 20 different people uh, that we will make available to download. So this way we want to promote uh, the use of uh, virtual clinical trials, for instance, um, and then like to try to explore further the, uh, the anatomy and information encoded in these meshes. A uh, thing that I want to, um, to show here also is the valves. Uh, we didn't we didn't model uh, with the leaflets because we couldn't see that much in the in the CT images, but just as a surface to close the endocardium because we needed a close a closed endocardium uh, endocardial surface for the mechanics to preserve the volume. So um, from this, uh, we move to the statistical shape model. It's uh, she explained it very well like yesterday. Uh, briefly, we started with the uh, with the CT cohort. And then we extracted the surfaces, we reparametrized them, so we don't depend on the actual spatial coordinates of each point because each mesh had a, a different number of points. Uh, we aligned them rigidly, uh, we embedded them in a set of landmark points, so then they all are in the same uh, reference systems, let's say. Uh, so then we can refer to local geometrical information and not the absolute uh, spatial information, as I mentioned before. With this, we created an average mesh or a template mesh uh, from which then we could compute uh, the difference with respect to each one of the meshes, of the of the other meshes here. Um, and then we did principal component analysis on this difference. Uh, this allowed us to uh, check how much each of these uh, hearts differ from the average mesh uh, in a more, um, in a more thorough way than the classical biomarkers. So with this, we obtained 18 modes because we discarded one of the hearts because uh, the last one, um, because the atrial anatomy uh, differed too much from the rest. So we prefer to have a more um, coherent um, set of hearts. Uh, now the problem here is how to interpret these modes. So um, the main one and the one that it's mainly um, shown is that they are the directions where the projected data has the maximal variance. So how they are distributed, like the, um, where are the points going? We want to see that way. Uh, they are also an orthogonal basis, meaning that we can um, describe each one of the hearts as a linear combination of the modes. 
So we have a uniquely set of weights of this linear combination uh, to describe each one of the hearts. So then we can use those weights to try to describe what happens in the, in the simulations of the heart. Uh, and as I mentioned, they are mainly the, the main changes uh, with respect to the average heart. So we will be referring always uh, to this template mesh that I showed before. Uh, we can also compute the, the variance explained by each one of the modes. So we normalize the variance and we saw that uh, mode 9 can explain up to 90% of the cumulative variance. So for further analysis to have less, uh, less modes around, uh, we'll focus uh, up to mode 9. So the analysis will be there. Okay. So another way to try to um, understand better uh, what these modes are is to try to visualize them somehow. So the way that we uh, thought about it is to uh, use some data augmentation and create these uh, extreme cohorts. So uh, bear with me here. Basically, the average mesh uh, has the weights all to zero by definition. Um, then uh, modes, uh, sorry, hearts uh, one to 19 have certain weights, whatever they are. And the idea here is to create a new cohort of, of meshes where we set all of the weights to zero, except the first one in this case, where we set to three standard deviations of all the weights of the city cohort. Then the next mesh will be minus three standard deviations, so we have the extremes of the space. Then we do the same with mode two, and so on and so forth, and we repeat it up to mode nine. So we end up in this extreme three cohort that we called, uh, with 18 meshes, uh, where, we, uh, where uh, each mesh is plus minus three standard deviations of each one of the modes up to mode nine. Okay, so this is how it looks like, this cohort. So there's a lot of information in, um, in, this, in this slide. So I want to focus your attention to, for example, mode two, uh, where we see that it's mainly changes in size. So um, higher values of mode two reflecting bigger hearts, as well as uh, thinner uh, walls. Mode four is uh, mainly, for example, the, uh, the size of the aorta, the diameter of the aorta, getting smaller as the mode uh, gets bigger, as well as creating a more uh, rounder uh, right ventricle, creating a more pointy apex if the values of mode four are lower. And then uh, the modes are ranked according to the anatomical variance that they can explain. And so mode nine explain very little uh, anatomical variance, around 3%. Uh, and the main change is a bit of a, of a change in the, um, in the anterior part of the heart, the posterior part of the heart, as well as, uh, as creating this bulge here in the, in the left ventricle, in the basal part. This is a cross section of the left ventricle and it's, uh, it's this uh, thickening in the, um, under the, the aortic valve. So uh, also another thing that we can see from here is that uh, each one of the modes uh, does not affect a unique area or it's not, they are orthogonal in the mathematical way, but from the clinical point of view, it's a bit more um, mingled between uh, between them. So there's not a single mode that can explain, say, uh, size, uniquely size, or uniquely the uh, thickness of the left ventricle or biomarkers like that. So from this, uh, I move to um, to simulations. So uh, the setup here, uh, um, as I mentioned, I'm going to be focusing on electromechanical simulations. So we use CARP, the cardiac arrhythmia research package. Um, that we, then for the mechanics, uh, we use Archer, the supercomputer here in UK, in Scotland. Um, the setup for the simulations, I can I, do, I don't want to go too much into detail for the sake of time, but basically uh, we fixed all the parameters. We did not personalize the data because we want to focus the attention on the changes in anatomy, not the changes in the, in the parameters. We set the trias passive, so the uh, the, con the contractile part of the heart uh, will be the ventricles, but we included the data to have uh, physiological boundary conditions. The initial conditions for the electrophysiology, uh, we set to an instantaneous activation in the bottom third of the, of the endocardium in both ventricles. And for the mechanics, the boundary conditions that we set uh, were also described um, this year by, by Marina in a paper in, in PLOS One, if I remember well. And uh, so basically we use robin boundary conditions that are spring-like boundary conditions. So we set them in the superior vena cava as well as the superior superior uh, pulmonary veins. And we set um, also robin boundary conditions in the epicardium of the ventricles, uh, mimicking the pericardium. 
in a way that uh, we apply a penalty to the normal displacement so the heart can only move uh, apex to base or base to apex and we put the maximum penalty in the apex and minimal in the in the base leaving the base free in this way we can allow a more physiological base to apex motion rather than apex to to base we simulated one heartbeat and we use the Wien Kessel model for the circulatory system, which is uh, very similar to a, an electric circuit system. We use two Wien, Kessel, two Wien Kessel models, one for the left side and one for the right side. So, um, so you have a, an overview of the computational load that I mentioned before. Um, the electrophysiology uh, takes around half a minute in a desktop machine. We use the reaction economy model, so it's very fast. And for the mechanics, uh, we use Archer, uh, 432 cores, and it took um, an average almost nine hours. Um, then another problem that we bump into is the convergence of these uh, of these simulations. So we are dealing here, in the case of the mechanics, with nonlinear mechanics, uh, with complex shapes. So it's it's hard uh, to know beforehand which uh, simulations are going to converge and which not. So I have to thank here uh, Christoph Augustin from the University of Graz to, uh, for helping with, uh, with all the numerics. Um, so with the electrophysiology, we didn't have any problem with the convergence, but uh, with, the, um, with the mechanics, two of the meshes of the city cohort, we didn't manage to uh, make them converge. Uh, the average mesh converge, and the extreme three cohort, four of the meshes didn't converge. Uh, so we thought that this could be because they are too extreme um, anatomical, too extreme anatomically. So we reduce uh, these um, variabilities. So we repeated the same as we did with the extreme three cohort, but instead of using plus minus three standard deviations, we use plus minus two standard deviations. In this way, we managed to, uh, with the same setup numerically, uh, we managed to convert um, almost all of them. Only one didn't converge. But this one was uh, relating mode two when we modified mode two. And the ones modifying mode two in the extreme three cohort also didn't converge. So um, to have a bit more of data about this mode, we created uh, another um, two meshes that we call the extreme one cohort, that it's plus minus one standard deviation, but only in mode two to have this, uh, this data on this mode. So, um, just a bit, um, a bit overview on the on the output. So, for example, uh, we observe like a, um, a motion that it's a basal to apex uh, mostly, um, where we apply the boundary, the roving boundary conditions. We don't observe any any displacement, so it's, it's what we were expecting. And then we have um, several outputs, several phenotypes. So um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, some of them, for example, is volumic relaxation time, injection fraction, DPDT max, or QRS duration. They have they had a uh, different variance between them. So since the idea here was to now link uh, these phenotypes with the modes, as we analyzed before in the in the statistical chain model, uh, we discarded those that didn't have enough or that they, they have small variance, anatomical variance, because they then if there was any correlation with the modes, will be mainly noise. So we set this threshold of uh, 0.2 over the, so this was the range, so the maximum minus the minimum of the of each one of the phenotypes over the average of that specific phenotype for all the CT cohort. So we discarded this, um, these phenotypes for the LV or the RV respectively. Um, so as I showed before, uh, the simulations are quite expensive computationally, so we couldn't do um, sensitivity analysis like we didn't have enough data to do a classic, let's say, sensitivity analysis, a local sensitivity analysis. So we went for a global sensitivity analysis based on uh, Gaussian processes. So uh, based on the work of Stefano Longobardi, one of my colleagues from uh, Steve Niedler group, and the idea here is to take as an input uh, each one of the weights that describe each one of the hearts for the city or for the extreme cohort. Uh, we have like through normal simulation, uh, we have each one of the of the phenotypes. And the idea here is to use an emulator, a Gaussian process simulator, which is a, a simulation of the simulation, we can say. So it's a way faster manner to uh, to achieve these uh, phenotypes. We, there's um, there's some uncertainty attached to the to the emulator. So as long as we manage to to keep this uncertainty um, narrow. 
uh, we can trust the, the results and then use that huge amount of data that we can create now to, you, uh, to do the, the sensitivity analysis. So we train the, the emulator with all the all the extreme cases, all the extreme cohorts that we call it here synthetic, and we uh, follow a leave one out strategy for the city cohort. So we included all of them but one, and we use that left out case uh, to do the validation. We repeated this process with all the heart of the of the city cohort uh, because we wanted to make sure that we were interpolating well in the in the anatomical space. We didn't want to um, extrapolate. Too much with the, with extreme cohorts. So with this, uh, we are able now to use the emulator uh, given a certain weight that we distributed uh, randomly. We have new um, phenotypes, um, and we repeated this uh, over 38,000 times, following a so-called sensitivity analysis. So with this, we can show a variance-based sensitivity analysis. Um, again, I won't go too much into the math behind it uh, for the sake of time, but uh, the diagrams that I will be showing now are uh, these donut charts. So it's a uh, normalized variance, so meaning that if any of these chunks is uh, one, means that it's completely explained by uh, that certain mode. Uh, the, posi the, relative, the relative position uh, will be as is shown here. So the darker the red means that it's that that phenotype is explained main, mainly by the uh, first modes. If it's more uh, more pinkish, it will be more explained by the later modes. And then um, for the visualization, we cluster all modes from 10 to 18 in the in the gray chunk. And then if there were interaction between uh, different modes that were not uh, only explained by individual modes, we put it in the in the black piece of the of the donut chart. So this is one of the of the main results of this of this project. Um, so we divided the phenotypes in in different uh, groups. So we have volume based groups, pressure based, time duration based, or electrophysiology based. So for example, in the volume based group in the left ventricle, we can see how it's mainly dark red, meaning that it's mainly explained by the first mode, which makes sense because the first modes are explaining most of the anatomical variants. So uh, they affect mainly the uh, in diastolic volume or the myocardial mass, for example. So that makes sense that they modify, that they are the main are responsible for uh, the volume based phenotypes. But then if we move to the pressure based phenotypes or even some timing phenotypes, we can see how uh, the main role is played by uh, mode nine. Mode nine uh, was, this, um, was this mode that I showed before, uh, we creating this small bulge in the, in the basal part. So uh, these cases, I repeat, they are healthy control. They are not, in principle, hypertensive or any other cardiac condition. Um, but we see how it creates a huge role to explain uh, phenotypes uh, quite relevant clinically, such as DPDT max. And then in the case of, uh, of the electrophysiology group, uh, it's everything needs a bit more uh, complex because there are more, more modes interacting between each other. So there's not a single mode that explain um, mostly any of the of the electrophysiological phenotypes. So um, basically with this we tried, uh, I tried to give an, an overview of how we try to close this uh, gap between cardiac anatomy and cardiac function, but of course there are some limitations, there are some considerations that we need to take into account in the study. So in terms of the volume, uh, we observe how uh, the mean volume uh, in our population in the city cohort were uh, smaller than the ones reported in the UK Biobank study. And we um, we think that this can be due to uh, that the uh, populations are too different. So it's been reported that the uh, volunteers for the UK Biobank studies are healthier and uh, leaner than the average population. So this could be enough to create this change of, of volume there. In the segmentation, we also discarded the left atrial appendage because in some cases it was out of the field of view. So uh, to have a more um, coherent cohort, we decided to clip them in, in all of the cases. And we in the, in the case of the pulmonary veins, we only left these rings in the meshes to apply the mechanical boundary conditions, but we didn't leave, um, let's say, enough to, for example, for um, fluid dynamic simulations. Um, in the functional space, uh, as I mentioned, we fixed all the parameters because we wanted to check the, the anatomical effect. 
Uh, but in the future, maybe we could uh, include the uh, um, more personalized simulation and include that in the global sensitivity analysis to see how much does that change. And, and some of the phenotypes did not present enough variability in this uh, in this plot that I showed before with the dashed line, uh, because uh, probably because we fix all the parameters and some of them are quite dependent on the parameter chosen. So choosing the same parameters created a small variability. Uh, some of them in clinical values may have a higher variability. Uh, so this is another limitation of, of this study. So basically some takeaways that I think it's important to, uh, to carry from here is that uh, the Gaussian process simulators are a very good tool to try to overcome this problem of, uh, of uh, slow and really heavy computational um, simulations that depends on the phenotype. Uh, it, it can be described by a different mode, meaning that um, some of them uh, are explained by the big changes in anatomy, but some of them are mainly explained by small changes in, in anatomy, such as mode 9. Uh, and again, focusing on this mode nine, uh, which is um, thickening of the visceral part of the of the septum, has been related as an early biomarker of, of hypertension. So this can be a clue on why uh, this affects so much the hemodynamical um, phenotypes. And this has also consequences for for the imaging community because if we want to use um, medical images to then simulate things such as um, DPDT max and, and observe changes there, maybe we need more detail. Maybe it's not enough with, uh, say, echocardiography, for example, because uh, maybe we can miss some of the details, such as this uh, mode 9 that we observe here that has an important role in these phenotypes. And I just wanted to finish um, thanking all the people that have been involved in this project. So from um, Steve Nieder's group, to Pablo's group, all the people there, uh, all the clinicians from Guys and St. Thomas's that provided us with the, with the data and help us with some clinical advice, as well as from the more uh, technical part of the, uh, of the CAR people, both in Bordeaux and in, and in Graz, that help us with the software and with some problems that we had with the, with the numerics there. So, yeah, I'm happy to take any, any question. Thanks a lot, Cristobal. I need to apologize here yeah, because Blanca was meant to moderate the session, and with the, the stress of the presentation at the beginning, which I completely forgot. <laughs> I don't know whether you're around. Or you want to take the lead the questions, but yes, that was a mistake on my side. Questions that paper is open for comments. Like hello. Yes, hello. You're forbidden. Don't don't, don't worry. <laughs> um, so, uh, Cristal, this is amazing work, and uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I was I was wondering whether you can comment on um, on the the dependency of the results with the emulators or on any parameters you don't vary. Yeah. So um, I didn't present. Yeah, I didn't present it here for the sake of time. But uh, we also did a, a local sensitivity analysis on the main uh, parameters that we fixed. So, um, for example, some of the parameters for the for the mechanic simulations, uh, the boundary conditions, also like the stiffness of the of the springs in the boundary conditions. Uh, we also modify things like uh, the conduction velocity for the electrophysiology, how we set the initial conditions, uh, and we saw that there's not a huge effect, and it seems that it's mainly. Uh, due to changes in anatomy, not that much in, into function. And if I can follow up from that, so mm -hmm. I, I was, I mean, I was looking at the um, at the ejection fraction mm -hmm. you obtained in the at least in the in the papers that I, I could scan through, and we had that difficulty as well that the ejection fraction was quite low. Yep. In in it was about thirty percent in your study, or you know, quite low. It wouldn't be normal. So I. I of course, in the, in this cohort of patients that you publish, it was heart failure patients. So you you can you can get away from you know with that ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. But I, I was wondering whether this is truly the effect of the uh, the anatomy, or you know something in the model needs to be improved to actually be able to obtain healthy ejection fractions. And what's your 
experience with that and also with the torsion um, of the model because those are th those have been challenges we had to tackle so I just I was just wondering whether you could share experiences with those issues yeah so um, another problem that we had with this study was the validation part because since uh, we are not using the clinical uh, data from these patients because they just came to do a quick scan let's say. Mm -hmm. so there's not that much information there uh, we couldn't validate directly in a classic way, so we uh, the best that we could do was to match with uh, literature data, and it was also literature data that we used to uh, for the for the values of the fixed parameters. So uh, with these healthy values, uh, we we did manage to to reach around uh, I think it was 54, 55 percent of ejection fraction. Uh, but it was after including the pericardial boundary conditions because mm. before. Because before, like the um, the motion was a bit funky, it was creating some weird motions. But with the with the pericardium, we managed to constrain it more, so we allowed this more basal uh, motion up and down, and that uh, achieved a, a higher ejection fraction. Did you did you get torsion or not? Uh, yeah, that was more with the uh, with the assignment of the fibers. So we said uh, 80 degrees on the epicardium and minus 16 endocardium. If you remember well. Uh, the, pro uh, the problem is if they are to um, align, so we needed not to be completely parallel because then it created uh, yeah. it created too, uh, too much instabilities. Yeah. Uh, so it created a bit of torsion, not massively, but a bit, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Okay, one last minute question. We have been doing excellent in time. We are only two minutes behind schedule, but still, if there's a one last minute question, three, two. Jorge, I think, raise a hand. Okay, yes, go. For, as for the presentation. So um, I was wondering on the validation, so you don't even have ECG, for instance, to validate your simulation. No, um, there was also like uh, issues with the um, anonymization of the of the data and with uh, a bit of the data management. So um, yeah, we had uh, the CT scans. We had in some of the cases um, the QRS duration, if I remember well. Uh, but it wasn't that common because this was not a um, study per se. Uh, so it was just like the data that they have from people that didn't have any cardiac condition condition and they accepted to their data to be used. So depending on the technician, they acquired some data or others. So there was not um, a procedure there to have all the data needed. And another question is regarding the emulators. Mule, yeah. How long does it take to train them? And once trained, how long does it take to run the Gaussian velocity? So to train them, um, this was in a in a desktop machine, so around like a 20, it was a big desktop machine, so I think it was 24 cores, and um, it was trained on a GPU, and it was like around a day, something like that. So we trained a different emulator for each one of the of the phenotypes. So to train like through all the phenotypes, it was like around a day, and then to run them, it, it was it was very very fast. It was I don't know tenth of a second, something like that. So. Yeah. Okay. And very last thing is regarding the the statistical shift model. How do you get point correspondence? Sorry. How do you get point correspondence in the statistical uh, shape model? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes. Yeah, so, or. Yeah. So the problem that we had there is that uh, each one of the hearts had a different uh, amount of points. So we couldn't do a direct correspondence uh, with all the meshes. So uh, the way that we overcome this, uh, with I have to thank Machi again for this, uh, was to embed them, all of them. Once they are aligned, we embed them in a cube of uniformly uh, distributed uh, landmark points. So then we can refer to these landmark points and how they uh, deform with each one of the of the meshes with respect to the to the average mesh. So it's like a sort of registration. It's like a sort of. It's a sort of a registration of the meshes. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Almost like, um, like 
Yeah. Having those um, those landmark points there, uh, then we can see which ones are on, on the surface, for example, of the of the epicardium, and then we can see how those um, um, in which position are they in each one of the meshes. So it was like submerge them in in this cube of of points. Let's see how they change it. Okay, maybe if you want to follow up, uh, Jorge, with Maché and Cristobal. Yeah. If you, there is still doubt there. Uh, Great. Cool.